Hi everybody, this is Strati Papa Giorgio speaking and I'm with uh, Father Panayoti. Um, and uh, we have some of your questions written down here that we would like to, uh, that we would like, I would like to ask him on your behalf. And uh, you're not going to hear me very well, but, um, very well. but, um, uh, after, uh, but you'll be able to hear him very clearly and he'll repeat the questions as I ask them. So let me know if the sound is good. I'm watching from a phone. <clears throat> okay. Welcome everybody. It is good to have this and uh, I hope, uh, we benefit from it and may God bless, uh, Bless our efforts and, and bless everything we do. Yeah. Okay, Stradik. Okay. So somebody asks, uh, where are you from? And how many years have you been in Marietta? Uh, <clears throat> I was born and raised on the island of Cyprus. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know where it is, it's in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. Um, I... I grew up in Cyprus and um, went through the invasion of Cyprus by Turkey in 1974. I experienced the, the scare and the, um, the destruction and um, survived with my family and we were pushed out of our homes. So we became refugees in our own country. Actually, the United Nations and the United States never really recognized us as refugees because we were still in the country. Of our origin, so but but we lost everything, and and after that I served. After I finished uh, school, I served for two years in the military in Cyprus, and then after that I uh, came to the United States in 1978 to study um, engineering uh, at um, in New York at uh, the City College of New York, and that's where I started um, in the United States. That was 1978, many years ago. Um, the question is, um, how did I survive? And, uh, and somebody actually uh, asked, asked me a question, do we know that God exists? And how do we know that God exists? And uh, why do I believe and why am I a priest? Uh, especially because I first went to engineering, I became an engineer. I actually finished my degree in, um, in New York at uh, City College in chemical engineering. And uh, it was actually biochemical engineering because I had uh, like a minor in biology, molecular biology in particular. And I studied um, uh, all kinds of things, including uh, uh, viruses and cells. And we cut up uh, all kinds of mice and uh, frogs and, and did a lot of labs uh, trying to understand um, biology. But my main uh, focus was chemical engineering. So after I finished New York, I went to, uh, I got a, a scholarship for Notre Dame and I went to Notre Dame University in Indiana, in South Bend, Indiana, where I, I was enrolled in a PhD program uh, in reaction engineering. <clears throat> And that's when <clears throat> I felt my calling to the priesthood and I interrupted that um, uh, degree. I got out with a master's in chemical engineering after finishing uh, my dissertation, my, my master's thesis and writing a master's thesis in, in combustion engineering uh, in the design of uh, pellets for um, uh, catalytic converters. That was my main uh, focus in my graduate studies. And after that, I left uh, with a master's in chemical engineering and went to uh, Holy Cross uh, Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston, where um, I studied for the next three years and got my MDiv. I felt that that was not enough for me and, um, and that um, I needed more. So I looked around and uh, the then professor and later uh, uh, Archbishop of uh, America, Dimitrios, Archbishop Dimitrios, he guided me to a program in early Christian studies, which was a Catholic university in Washington, D.C., where I spent uh, the next seven years studying the fathers, the early period, uh, reading the texts in the original, both in Greek and in Latin, 
And um, from that came my dissertation on St. John Chrysostom, which is a study of the homilies of St. John Chrysostom on Romans. So that I enriched my, uh, my knowledge also in uh, not only in patristics and early Christian history, but also in the biblical texts, especially of Romans. Romans. Uh, St. St. Paul's epistle to the Romans. So through this process, um, I learned a lot. And not only I learned a lot, but I was touched very deeply in my life. And to answer the question, does God exist? I would say that through this process, I was reassured. I knew his presence. I felt his presence. I felt him speaking to me directly. I felt him guiding me. I felt him protecting me, especially through the invasion of Cyprus and through my years in New York, which were very dangerous at the time and very difficult. And then later guiding me to meet uh, the great saints of the modern church, like St. Paisius, St. Porphyrius, and all these people who reinforced my faith and solidified my faith. So I have no doubt in my, in my mind that God exists. I have no doubt in my mind that God is active in our lives, that God is powerful, that God uh, works in us and for us and protecting us when we need him, all we need to do is turn to him. And just to quote St. John Chrysostom, he says that God has done so much for us. And all we need to do is a little something to turn to him. And that will save us, and that will help us, and that will protect us, and that will guide us, and that will give us wisdom to answer all the questions of our life, and to help us through the difficulties and get us through. And to remember that life on this earth is not the ultimate purpose of, of, of us. He didn't create us so that we can live here eternally. He created us so that we can enter his kingdom. So difficulties in this life are a preparation for entering his kingdom. And we need to focus on the kingdom so that we can overcome with his power and his strength and his wisdom and his guidance the difficulties of this life. That is so significant and we need to, to make sure that we don't fall away from that. I hope this answers some of the questions that people may have. And uh, we can go to the next one, Stradi. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me? Regardless. Um, Sarah <coughs> Benzakis asks, what is the best and easiest response to the question, what is Orthodox Christianity? And I think that's a good question because it's a complicated one. Yeah. <laughs> How do you answer somebody in casual conversation, what is Orthodox Christianity? That's a good question. And, um, and having been brought up in the Orthodox Church, having lived in an Orthodox home with a priest, actually, because my grandfather was a priest. And, and I remember my earliest memories are uh, my grandfather taking me to the church on Sunday mornings or whenever he had liturgy, uh, when I was like six years old and seven years old, and uh, holding me by the hand and going through the dark, um, the dark streets, walking to the church. And then uh, he would open these big, huge doors of that church and go in and light the first candles. And then as soon as I learned how to read, he had me read the Psalms and he would start the Orthros and had me read the Psalms. So having been brought up in that environment, I understand that um, Orthodox Christianity is a way of life and it's a, a life of worship of God. It's a life where Christ is at the center and Christ is the hope and Christ is the Lord and Christ is the resurrection. He is the life. He is the only hope for this life because this life is difficult. And having lived in a small town in Cyprus, I experienced uh, all the aspects of this through the sacraments, of course, primarily. Uh, but I experienced death, I experienced joy, I experienced all the things of life. So Orthodox Christianity is a way of life centered on Christ and uh, where worship is at the center and Christ is at the center of all worship. With the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, with, with, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, because wherever one is, there is the other. There is perichoresis, the containment of one in the other. So Christ is the one we met in person as a human being walking on earth. And he came to us so that we can focus on him. And if we make him the center of our lives, then we are um, going to benefit from it greatly. And that's why we are Orthodox Christians. So, Hannah D. asks, I'd like to know how you define mysticism in the context of the Orthodox tradition. 
Okay, read the rest of this. No, mysticism. Let, let me talk about mysticism because I think that um, uh, one of the things that Orthodoxy has preserved by comparison to uh, Roman Catholicism as well as uh, especially the Protestants because Roman Catholicism may have some mystical aspects to it, but Roman Catholicism was completely thrown away uh, in the sense of... Um, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Protestantism has completely thrown it away by becoming very rationalistic um, and becoming very... Uh, they focused on the word. They focused on knowledge. They focused on understanding. And um, that is not enough in the relationship with God because God is beyond our comprehension. And this is where mysticism comes in. Where, what is mysticism? Is the, is the way we know that God is present and that God exists without necessarily understanding it. For example, we call the sacraments in the Orthodox Church, we call them mysteries, mysteria, where the mystical aspect is focused on or is, is uh, uh, shown as, as being the aspect of, the, of those sacraments, of those, of those events. What is a sacrament? which includes Holy Communion and, and the Eucharist. It includes, uh, say, the blessing of the water. It includes um, uh, confession. It includes all the sacraments that we know and, and sacraments that, that people don't think they're sacraments because uh, sometimes we focus on seven, but the Orthodox Church never uh, limited the sacraments to seven uh, because even the funeral, which is only given to Orthodox Christians, is a sacrament. Even, of course, the great uh, blessing of the water for Epiphany, uh, torture of monks and nuns, all these are sacraments. So, in a sacrament, God is present in a mystical way that our uh, senses cannot perceive. We can only know through our heart. We can only know through uh, Him touching us in a special way uh, as He is present to change, say, the bread and the wine and make it the body and blood of Christ, to change the water and make it holy water, to change this person and make them a priest in the sacrament of ordination, to change a person, make them a monk or a nun in the sacrament of the uh, kura, the, the tonsure of the monastics. So mysticism is really at the center of uh, the understanding of who we are and who God is, because God is present in a mystical way throughout our lives. And we emphasize that. Um, I think a, a good book to read, which gives in the conversations with uh, uh, the monk, uh, whose name is Maximus in that book, um, the author of the book, he is asking questions and he's getting answers from the monk, uh, the book of, uh, called The Mountain of Silence. In that book, you will see the mystical aspects of the church as the monk Maximus describes them. And... That is a great book to read for anyone, especially coming from the Protestant world, who wants to understand mysticism in the Orthodox Church. That monk gives a great description of the mystical aspects of Christianity, of Orthodox Christianity, which the others have lost to a, to a great extent. Okay, so the next question is uh, from Peregrino. I don't know if I said that right. Father, why is there so much gold and beauty uh, in, the Orthodox in Orthodox churches when we know that the Son of God was so simple during his time on earth? As the same occurred with the first, the same, did the same occur in the first churches? I am asking this not as a criticism, but to understand. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the question is um, why our churches are so ornate? and there are, there's gold in them, and there's beauty, and there is uh, colorful uh, icons. The priests wear beautiful vestments, uh, the, and, and, and all of this. Why are we spending so much money building churches that are so beautiful and, uh, and so ornate? And somebody asked me the question one time, why don't we give all the money to the poor? Okay, and um, the same question was asked of Christ, if you remember, uh, by Judas of all people, <laughs> uh, when he said, uh, why is this woman pouring all this mirror on your feet and on your head when we have sold it for 300 denarii and given it to the poor? And the, and the answer that Jesus gave at the time was that um, it's because she has 
uh, is bringing this to me for my burial. And then he says, you don't have me for very long, but you will have the poor forever. There are always going to be poor people. And the answer is not uh, to say that poor people don't need to be helped. I think that, that, that is really anathema for an Orthodox Christian to say. That is the center, actually, of our kindness and our philanthropy is to help the poor and the people in need and the people who are sick. Uh, and through the love that we show to the poor, we also show our love to God. Because if we don't love the poor and we don't love the human beings around us, how can we say that we love God? Uh, the human beings we can see and we can touch. And if we don't love them, how can we say we love God that we don't see? We don't see him. Anyway, so, but at the same time, our churches are decorated because they represent the kingdom of God on earth. And the beauty is the beauty that reminds us of the kingdom, that focuses on the kingdom, that lifts us up to the kingdom of God. And when you walk into a church, my, my church is quite beautiful in that sense. It's not very ornate. We haven't finished, actually, even the iconography. But it's very beautiful and it's awesome. So when you walk in, and I, I watch people, especially during the Greek festivals, that they walk in for the first time and, and they look up and they see the Pantocrator and they say, wow, this is amazing. When you walk into an Orthodox church, any Orthodox church, even with the, the minimal decorations and the minimal expense, you are in awe. And that is what the purpose of this is. You want to lift people up. The church is the, um, especially when we celebrate the Divine Liturgy, uh, it is the kingdom of God on earth. And the purpose of these uh, decorations are to lift us up and remind us of the kingdom of God and the beauty of it and the joy that it will give us. As for the priests and their vestments, they are not personal. They don't belong to them. They are uh, the vestments of the church. We can't wear them anywhere else. We can't wear them in the marketplace. So we're not really showing off our wealth or whatever. They are a symbol of the transformation of the human being into a priest to serve at the altar where the angels even cannot approach. And so that's really the goal for that. And I'm not in favor of uh, expensive vestments and I'm not in favor of uh, golden things uh, over and above what uh, people can afford. But at the same time, beauty is really essential in uplifting um, the spirits of the parishioners and uplifting the Christians uh, to help them, to inspire them to enter the kingdom of God, even in the here and now, and to experience it here and now. Okay, so um, I still don't know if anybody can hear me. <laughs> My... <laughs> it's okay, I, I will repeat the question. Yeah, okay. Um, so this comes from Nancy in Canada, and she, she's a, a long time, long time. She's been a viewer of our live streams. She's always there. I think some of these other ones came from people like that. Okay, they can't hear me. So that's good. Okay. Um, so her question is, what is the Orthodox view of heaven and hell? With a heart full of gratitude. Thank you, she says. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I think that the, in English, heaven and hell have been used and misused, I think, in many ways. Because uh, many times uh, in the scriptures it says uh, Hades, and immediately the English translation becomes hell. Well, they didn't say hell. Hell is a place of torment. Colossus uh, would be the, the Greek word, for example. Um, and heaven has different connotations too. So we got to be careful what the translation what the original word, especially in the scriptures, is before we translate into hell or even into heaven. Um, the Orthodox Church understood always that uh, there is, I mean, Christ himself spoke about this, okay? And he explained what that might be. And that's where we need to go, not to things that people make up, but go back to Christ himself. And I think that the first time that he speaks about uh, the afterlife in the sense of uh, a place of difficulty and, and, um, and suffering is when he gives us the parable of uh, Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man and Lazarus. And uh, he explains how the rich man who never cared about Lazarus and never cared about anybody else, he was uh, very selfish and always uh, partying and, and, and enjoying himself and enjoying the riches that he had and ignoring those who were in need. 
uh, he died and he went to a place of torment. And he gives us some descriptions which are very physical descriptions. And we, we have to be very careful not to take uh, everything literally, but to understand that there is physical pain if you are, in, especially if you are in your physical body, which is eventually going to be as we resurrect and are separated. Again, he described this as separated later when he gave us the parable of the last judgment. And he said, the ones who did these things, the good things are going, uh, are going to be invited into the kingdom of God and the others will be rejected and they will go to a place of torment. So when we speak about heaven and hell, we have to define that, uh, yes, what you can call hell in English or a place of torment is a place of difficulty and definitely torment. What is heaven is a place of joy and a place of uh, the experience, the full experience of the presence of God in a way that we cannot comprehend. And in the, in the place of torment is the experience of the love of God, perhaps, as the people reject him. And that brings pain and sorrow. So when people reject God, that would lead them to pain and sorrow, even though the love of God would be poured on them. And those who love God and receive the love of God, which is poured on them, will, will have joy. So maybe that's a good way to put it in, in non-physical ways or in, uh, in human ways that we understand. But even in the scriptures and even the saints, when they try to describe this, they use human um, words and human descriptions like fire and this and the other thing. Because those are the things that give us pain. And that's how we experience difficulty. But think of it in a spiritual way. And perhaps think of the love of God giving joy but the love of, to those who love him and the love of God giving pain to those who hate him and reject him. So this is a, another question that I think we've been hearing and we've been, some, to, and some of us may have even experienced this. Um, some priests, and there was an announcement recently uh, from Germany, that uh, that they're not going to give Holy Communion. I don't know if that was retracted or what, but there was a um, an announcement that I read myself that uh, they won't be giving communion, and also, you know, others saying that you can get sick from communion. What are your thoughts on that? Well, <laughs> of course, this is the challenge of the coronavirus, and I remember when. Uh, AIDS came around, and we had the same challenge 30-some years ago. Uh, and, um, I don't remember that. You don't remember that. <laughs> it's before your time. But uh, we, we went through that process at the time, and uh, I remember talking to uh, Father Nicholas Pecadoros, for example, when he was my spiritual father in, uh, in Virginia, Northern Virginia at the time. And we discussed this, and how can you believe that the bread and the wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ to give you life eternal, to heal you in every possible way and open the kingdom of God to you, which is eternal life. How can you believe that the same body and blood of Christ, which gives eternal life, will actually give you sickness and bring you death? That, that is contrary to everything that um, we understand about the body and blood of Christ. But this is the problem. You see, today... We're very rationalistic. We have been affected by a rationalistic world in which we live, where everything has to be explained logically. The mystical aspects are being pushed away by some people, even within the church. And I think people fall into that trap and they cannot get out. And that is very sad for me to see that. And if a priest does that, of course, it's more sad because he's not leading people correctly. So, but we need to understand that the body and blood of Christ are life eternal for us and we're not going to die from it we're going to live eternally it's for healing of soul and body so when a priest offers the body and blood of christ to people he says for the forgiveness of sins and for life eternal and so we need to understand it this is the mystical thing about holy communion and we need to understand it that way and never never 
even for a moment, consider the Holy Communion would give us a disease. So, um, this is another one. It's totally different than this. But uh, I've been seeing various people ask the same question. Um, people who are interested in becoming Orthodox, but there's no Orthodox church nearby them. Yeah. Um, what are your... Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I think they need to, and today we're very blessed because we have uh, the internet and we have the ability to um, live stream our services. So what I would suggest, if they have internet, which I assume they do if they're able to, answer the, to ask the question, right? Yeah. To use the internet, to use the, um, the live streams, to immerse yourself in prayer, to immerse yourself in the liturgy as if you're there. And God will supplement. God will Fill the gaps. And when the time comes, he will send you someone to receive you into the church. He will give you the opportunities to be received officially into the church and to receive the Holy Communion, the body and blood of Christ. But be patient. Just do what you need to do. Immerse yourself in prayer and read Orthodox books and follow Orthodox uh, liturgies. And, uh, you, and God will bless you. It's just that this is your own tribulation and your own, and he will test your own patience. And God will fill the gaps and will give you what you need. Um, so, what, um, what? Can you give us some? Uh, do you know about the Philokalia? I know you do, but uh, can you give us some, you know, thoughts on the Philokalia? I've, I've heard you say before that it's kind of a heavy, heavy thing to just dive into. Yeah, the Philokalia is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is five volumes. I, I have it both in Greek and English. I don't think the final volume has come out as far as I know. But in, in Greek, um, we have the five volumes. I've been reading it for many years. Um, it is it's a wonderful book. It has amazing texts, but some of them are very difficult texts. And of course, they come from the hands of very uh, deeply spiritual monastics. And... Um, and Many of them, most of them are actually directed toward monastics. So it's very difficult for a uh, lay person who lives in the world to understand or to even um, uh, be able to live the way that the monastics have uh, lived. So if you want to read the Philokalia, go ahead and do it. Be careful, though, because um, don't try to apply the things that are expected from the monastics in your own life in this world, especially if you have family and if you have children and if you have a job. Uh, but the Philokalia is a good book. If you if you want uh, if you want to read some some things that are more approachable, I think you should read uh, the lives of modern saints. Leave the li read the life of uh, Saint Basius, uh, Saint Porphyrios, Wounded by Love, and many other things that are available. There are Rus Russian saints and and um, other saints that um, their lives are more approachable to us, and their teaching is the same. It's the same teaching. The Philogalia is more deep because it comes from monastics. It applies more to monastics. And, um, but it's good also for all of those of us who are able to practice those things. So this one is a little bit of a controversial one. Um, uh, so it's about the vaccine uh, or vaccines in general. Well, just the coronavirus vaccine. And this person asked, is it the mark of the beast? Uh, which, you know, it's the 666, the, or at least that's how it's interpreted. I don't know if it actually says 666 in Revelation. The mark of the beast. Does it say 666? Well, I think, I think the person who's asking the question probably has been on in the internet yeah. and there's a lot going on. They're also, from, they're also from Europe, from Eastern Europe, where, okay. know, where like, <clears throat> peace and, and, and stuff, where that kind of thing has been talked <clears throat> about for like maybe 50 years yeah. now. Let me, let me first, I, I think this is an important question, and let me, let me just say first that um, there's a lot of discussion since, since you were born, and before you were born, there's discussion on the vaccines. Are vaccines good? Are vaccines bad? Are vaccines harmful? Are vaccines helpful? And, um, and, 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 and there, is, there is evidence that uh, vaccines have affected people negatively, uh, and in fact, uh, the, the government in the United States actually has... Uh, helplines and all kinds of things to, to actually uh, address, address the negative effect of vaccines on people. But vaccines are just like every other um, medical method, okay? Uh, 
that's why we have so many different medications for so many different things. And again, uh, I don't want to defend the, the big pharmaceutical companies because they're very greedy and, and they have done a lot to harm people instead of help them. And they will, they will not do anything unless it's profitable for them. And I understand that. That's capitalism. And I think that's where government needs to come in sometimes and help by providing, uh, let's say, uh, money to do research independently of the, uh, the big uh, pharmaceutical companies. But in governments, not just one government, but the governments around the world. And, and I think that um, the, the, the history of vaccines, in spite of the fact that it has some negative aspects that have negatively affected people and harmed people, they have a lot of positive things as well. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there because I don't want to talk about vaccines in general. It's a big topic. A lot of people, they hear the word vaccine and they go crazy and they want to, they wanna, you know, I mean, correct every, everybody and tell everybody that uh, stay away from vaccines because they're bad, because something happened to them or to somebody they love. And I, I, feel, I feel for them and I'm not going to justify anything that happened which is negative because we don't want anyone to be hurt by anything. But medications hurt people. Okay, we know medications that hurt people. I know I take some medications myself for different things. And I know that people who take the same medication that I take and doesn't harm me are harmed by it. And so the doctors have to try different things to help people. But think of the world without medications and the deaths that occurred. I mean, even before, even in the early times of this century, before uh, uh, the new medications that help us with... Uh, uh, different diseases and different things came, the average lifespan was about 48 years. And today the lifespan is more than 78. It's close to 80. So, and the reason is because we have these medications that, that help us. Okay, so think of the world before um, uh, their antibiotics. Antibiotics are not good for you if you abuse them. But if you get sick and there's no way to be helped, antibiotics are the best way for you to to kill the, the particular infection. So you're not going to take antibiotics because uh, one of the antibiotics, say, is harmful for one person and the other antibiotic is harmful for another. You need to do what you need to do to help yourself. Of course, you can go and live without anything and that's your freedom. And you can do that if you want. And nobody's going to uh, hurt you if, you if you decide never to take an antibiotic. I think the vaccines... Um, were, were different in the sense that the governments decided to do it because there was so much disease that was going on. And, and then, of course, some people got hurt, but most people were helped. And that's the way vaccines function. I'm not in, I'm not in defense of what is in the vaccines. I'm not in defense of what uh, might be that uh, you need to do. I'm not telling you what to do. It's your choice. And it's your choice to receive the vaccine for the coronavirus if the vaccine for the coronavirus and when the vaccine for the coronavirus is actually developed. It would be your choice to receive it or not. Nobody's going to force you to do it. Nobody can force you. And the other thing that I wanted to say about this, because I've been talking to doctors and I've been reading a lot medical things in the last few weeks as these things are unfolding. And what I realized is that there are, first of all, there are more than um, 20 different labs in 20 different countries of the major countries that are doing research in this area. And uh, when the vaccine comes out, it's not going to be one vaccine. It will be probably 20 different vaccines. Yeah. So, and then, uh, shall we take the vaccines or not? That's a good question, okay? We need to ask the question. It's a fair question to ask. And you need to talk to a doctor that will be able to guide you before you take it. Yeah. But at the same time, um, remember that we have uh, Christian doctors. We have uh, faithful people. We have people in NASA. We have people in the, in the, um, uh, the Health Institute in, in Washington, D.C. We have people around the world in Orthodox universities, in, in Orthodox countries, in universities, who are studying these things. We have microbiologists and we have uh, people working in the disease, uh, infectious, infectious disease area that are Orthodox Christians who are very faithful. I know many of them. And I speak with them. And, those, and I trust those people that they're not going to allow in the vaccine that is given to their own children or to themselves or to their uh, wife or to their relatives. They're not going to allow anything that they know is harmful 
or that is suspicious. So all of this, um, all of this fanfare and all this this uh, obsession with uh, the conspiracy theories about uh, that we're going to be injected with vaccines and they will contain uh, uh, these microchips that will control our lives and control our brains. Yeah. I think that is absolute nonsense. Please get away from that stuff. Do not circulate that stuff. And, uh, and I, I have to tell you that about this, this issue, and some people talk about Sebaesios and what he said. I met Sebaesios. I sat at his feet. He actually addressed this thing in my presence. When there was a, and I talk about this in my lecture I gave recently. Um, I was there with him. There was a priest, a monk, another lay person, and myself. And the priest, the young priest, asked, it was a time, it was in 1986. It was a time that Greece was boiling with this, uh, they're going to stamp us with the 666. They're going to give us uh, whatever. And the government is going to do this to us. And the priest brings the question to St. Paisius. And St. Paisius says to him, Father, do you believe in Christ? And the priest says, yes, of course, of course. And then St. Paisius repeats again. He says, uh, do you believe that Christ is more powerful than the devil? And the priest says, yes, of course, yes, of course. And then St. Paisius says, um, if you believe in Christ and you believe that Christ is more powerful and you love Christ and, you, and your heart is turned to him and only to him, even if they stamp you all over your body with anything that says 666 or whatever, as long as they cannot touch your heart and your faith and your love for Christ, they can do nothing to you. Recently, I was listening to uh, Father Athanasius, Bishop Athanasius, Metropolitan of Limassol, uh, who was asked the same question. He says, unless you give in willingly to the Antichrist or to Antichrist things, which sometimes we do, okay, through our behaviors, the bad behaviors, we violate the, the, the commandments of Christ and the commandments of God, and that's what, when we turn and become, uh, uh, we become uh, pride to the, to the Antichrist. Because violating the commandments of Christ is the worst way to go. So, if willingly you don't violate the will of Christ, if willingly you do not reject him, nothing can touch you because Christ will be there with you. He's more powerful than anyone and, and he is going to protect those who love him. And just one last comment, and I'm planning to do, um, uh, I'm planning to do something online with, um, with the book of Revelation sometime soon perhaps in the summer. We'll see how it goes. Um, the, the entire book of Revelation, with people today take it and make it into a threatening book and a horrible book and a, a, a book of terror. You know what that book is? It's a book of assurance to those who believe in Christ as God, that he will be there for them to protect them. And the saints around the throne of God, at the altar of God, are praying for those of us who are struggling in this world. So the church triumphant, who are already at the throne of God, are praying for the church militant, which is us. And we have enough wisdom that is given to us, given to those of us who are praying, and those of us who, who believe, and those of us who um, are faithful to God. There is enough wisdom given to us, and it will be given to us, that we may never uh, go astray unless we decided to do it on our own will. And we chose the devil instead of God. And then I'll give you one more comment from a nun uh, in Greece who wrote a beautiful text, which um, I, I, I intended to translate to English, but I never got to it. On this, she asked, if they're able to inject all of us with uh, a chip and nobody will realize it, then there's no reason for anyone of, us, anyone of us to live on this world. That would be the end of the world. And if God chooses to allow that to happen, then that would be the end of the world. But there's no reason for us to be scared of it because God is in charge in the end. And no matter what happens, he will protect us and he will receive us into his kingdom as he intends to and as he wants to. Well said. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, another question somebody's been asking persistently, so I figure we should just... Okay. Daniel Schweil asks, Father, please, is it a bad time to get married now? Is it, everything going on? Is it a... 
Ah, time to get married. Is it not a good time to get married? Yeah. Uh, I don't think that I I really I don't know. I mean I what I what I need to say is that we are delaying marriages because people want to have parties and people have to have big gatherings. But I'm doing a marriage next week or two weeks from now because people just want to get married and and um, and I think it's a great time. As long as you don't gather 200 people to party with you and you only have your basic close relatives, that, that is as good a time as any. So, but if you want to do a big party and invite 200 people, yeah, you're going to have to wait. So another question is by, uh, I don't even know, Gia Sherpsi. Over several years of being in a career of my dreams, I had to quit because it was such a hostile environment. I cannot work now because of my health. How do I know if God might want me to take, I think the, uh, the different direction in life. Basically, it's how do I know which way God wants me to go? Mm -hmm. You know, does he want me to go this way or that way? And I have another one about the Mosaic Law after this. So. Okay. <laughs> so that, that, is a, that is a personal question, of course, and I really cannot answer except in a general way. But if, if uh, you want to approach me and discuss this with me privately, I'd be glad to do it. Or if you have a spiritual father that uh, is close to you and you can discuss it with him, that would be even better because if he knows you, the better he knows you, the better uh, his uh, uh, answer would be to you. But, you know, I, I think that uh, these are difficulties in life sometimes and, and we're presented with difficulties. The, so the whole coronavirus issue is, is, a, uh, is a difficulty for the whole world. So, the way we need to approach these things is that uh, we, we approach with patience, we approach with pa prayer, we ask God to guide us, and because of God's love and God's um, caring for us, He will eventually show us the right way and show us where to be. And sometimes we lose something we think we love, um, but in fact God has something better for us or something that is better for our soul and for our salvation. So. I'm not sure how to answer the question specifically, but I think that this is, this is as much as I can give you in a general way. Yeah. So another question by Elias Wakile. Why do we Orthodox Christians not keep the Mosaic Law concerning the laws, of, uh, the laws that... Basically, why don't we keep the Mosaic Law? Uh, well, because um, the early Christians, um, including starting with what Christ said, that... Um, he came to fulfill the law, and then St. Paul takes it a step further and concludes that uh, the old Israel obeying the law and continuing in that direction is not what God wants, but the new Israel uh, recognizing the Messiah in Christ is, uh, the, is the new law. And, and this is very logical for the early Christians. It was very logical for them. The, they saw the law as the preparation for the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah has come. The law was fulfilled. And now the new law is the law of love. The new law is the resurrection. The new law is the kingdom of God is open for everyone. The new law is to live according to the teaching of Christ. So the old law, which is the Mosaic law, which is um, the, the meticulous rituals, but not the commandments. The Ten Commandments are kept. The commandments of God are kept. They are eternal. And now, added to that, are the commandments of Christ, which is love your enemy, not only your friend, and um, turn the other cheek. And the, the bar has been raised. See, the, the ancient Mosaic law used to say, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Christ says, no, that is not the way you're going to do it. So he brings another law. He brings a higher law. He brings the law of love. And we need to follow that. So, the law, the Mosaic law, including the Ten Commandments, was a preparation for the Jews to receive the Messiah. We receive the Messiah, we follow his law, but the Ten Commandments still remain because they are eternal. They were given from the Logos who became flesh. They were given from the Logos to the world at the time, and the Logos is now asking us to continue uh, in that direction and follow his new commandment, which is the commandment of love. So we have 155 people watching. Oh, that is wonderful. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm very glad that you're listening. 
Uh, Send us your questions and we'll stay on. How much time more we have? Because 40, 44 minutes, so we, we have time. Okay. Um, this is a question about Catholic uh, turning orthodoxy to orthodoxy from Catholicism. Okay. Um, my family and us, Caleb Moons, this is from the chat now. Yeah. So. Uh, my family and I are Anglo Catholics, and, and we are considering becoming Orthodox. What do you believe would be the largest hurdle for us to convert? Thank you, Father Vayardi. Okay, um, I think that the, okay, from my experience, I've been receiving uh, Roman Catholics and Protestants into the Orthodox Church for the last 30 some years. So I think that the biggest difficulty for Western Christians becoming um, Eastern Christians and joining and becoming Orthodox Christians is um, the um, legalistic approach to everything. Uh, and, and I have seen it in converts sometimes that they continue to be legalistic, even though I encourage them not to be. It's kind of ingrained in, in them, yeah. and they have to really um, try very hard to get away from it. Yeah. Um, so legalism is one. In some Roman Catholics who have been indoctrinated in the role of the Pope as a supreme authority in the whole world, that is a second problem. In the Orthodox Church, we don't have a supreme pope, a supreme authority. Christ um, is a supreme authority. Yeah, Christ is the head of the church. He's a supreme authority. And our bishops are all equal, and they make decisions in uh, council. Of course, there are times in history when things didn't go right, but that is, again, within the, um, uh, the, the God's providence and within uh, the human uh, fallenness, and then eventually the Holy Spirit um, supersedes and, and corrects things in the church. So the Holy Spirit runs the church. The bishops are part of that process of keeping the church uh, safe and uh, correct. So that's as much as I can say so we, right now. We, um, somebody's uh, asking, what is the, you know, we see in countries like Russia and, and the Slavic countries, the head covering. Yeah. And uh, why don't we do that? so much in I, I well they, they think that this is an, an or no, that we don't do this only in north america but we don't do this anymore anyway in greece or cyprus or yeah um yeah yeah um and it's in the bible too yeah St. paul actually says that the women sh women should cover their heads and um i grew up in cyprus at the time when uh, most women especially the older women would cover their heads as time went on uh, it was a societal change more than anything else and um, today the struggle is to keep the keep people dressed, uh, you know, covering their flesh. So, yeah. I, and sometimes I see I see women that may cover their head, but their dresses are very provocative. So I mean, you you gotta be careful. The head cover was a um, a sign and a symbol of the woman being humble and being um, uh, modest. not modest. Yeah. So. So if you cover your hair, but you, you are not modest in the way you look and the way your body is shown, then again, you're defeating the purpose. So I would say, um, based on how I grew up in the sense of not uh, having the head cover imposed by force, that if it is part of the culture where you are, keep it. It's good. If it's not part of the culture right now, don't force it. But it has to be representing modesty and... Uh, and modesty comes in many different ways, and not just with a head cover. Yeah. I, I like the head cover. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a good custom. Yeah, it's a good custom. If you can do it, do it, but yeah. don't force it on others. Or, or don't force it. people feel bad for not... Yeah, yeah. So uh, this person is referring to your, your background in engineering. I'm very... Uh, Helen Kopistecki. I'm very curious, going through engineering school, which is, of course, very scientific, to becoming a priest, how do you make sense be between your scientific science background and your theolo theology background? With love. <laughs> That's a really good question. I think that the question of uh, the conflict between science and theology is a Western, totally Western, uh, rationalistic problem. Okay, in the East, we never had a problem with that. And I grew up in the East. I'm a product of uh, a very um, immersed in Orthodox life, um, uh, 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 people, people in Cyprus, and especially when I grew up, which was in the you know late 50s, 60s, and 70s. So I'm an Easterner, and for me, science 
is the study of creation. Theology is not a study. Theology is an experience of God's presence. Can you understand that? Okay, so there is no conflict between the two because I'm not trying to study God in a systematic, scientific way as a theologian. That's not what I'm doing. I can never do that. Nobody can do that. And those who try, they fail and they lose their faith. God is present in a mystical way, as we said before. He's pre- I felt his presence many times in my life. I felt his protection many times in my life. I, heard, I felt his guidance many times in my life. And I don't want to say anymore, but having experienced his presence and his love and his guidance uh, brought me to become a theologian, to become a priest, to serve his people. And I didn't abandon my scientific inquiry and my desire to know more about the creation. But my knowledge of God has to do more um, with my prayer and with worship. Two different ways. I hope this satisfies the, the question. I mean, if the other ones uh, you have. Yeah, I mean, there's there's other ones here. How can I learn to really pray? What does that mean to really pray? A prayer is a good topic. Prayer is a very good topic, and let me just say a few words about it. That that uh, prayer is is like what we're doing right now. Okay. Uh, think of God on the other side. That right now, I, I cannot see you guys. I mean, you see me, but I cannot see you, right? So think of God on the other side who hears what we say, who is conversing with us, uh, who, is, who is hearing what we're saying, although you may not hear his voice. So we need to converse with God. We need to open our hearts and tell him how we feel. We need to tell him what our struggles are. We need to tell him um, what our needs are. Not that he doesn't know them. But that is good for us. And then we need to trust in him. Faith is trust. So what we are called to do is to surrender to him through prayer in faith and trust. And that is the proper prayer. Even if it's just simple words. I love you, Lord. Or thank you, Lord. Or Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Simple words like these are good. They measure in the services is so that we can leave the world behind. That's why it's good to attend the liturgical services. It gives us time to cut the world out and focus on our relationship with God. And, our, and that's why our services in the Orthodox Church are long too, for that purpose, to cut us off from the world. And that's why our churches have no windows on the level that we see, so that we won't look outside. That's another aspect of the church, the church building. Uh, because we need to cut the world off and focus on our relationship with God. And that is proper prayer. Um, they, just, they just keep popping in. <laughs> and I can't keep up my eyes. <laughs> it's like flashes of light. Um, how long do you want to go for? Well, I wanted to last about an hour, maybe an hour and ten minutes, but no more than that because I'm getting tired too. So I, okay. And I have something else later. Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, all right. Ten more minutes, maybe. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are many here, but um, and we're sorry to anybody who we didn't get to. Uh, you know, I'll make another post for everybody to res- to ask questions to in the next month when we do this again or whenever we do this again. We okay. Can, we can address every. Well, we'll try to address everybody. <laughs> um, uh, oof. So, um, what, what exactly inspired you to become a priest? <laughs> or you don't want to get into that? We could, we could well, do that one another time, maybe. Well, I mean, I can, I can talk about it. It's not a big deal, but uh, it's well, not... Well, how about I, appropriate relationships in the 21st century? And I think this one was asked by a parish, a, a parish, a parish on Instagram. That's their, you know, they say Nicholas or something from somewhere asked this question. Appropriate... Uh, Appropriately approaching relationships in the 21st century. And, and I don't know if they mean like, you know, romantic relationships, a cousin, you know, becoming, you know, getting a spouse, or they mean friendships, or I assume that's what they mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, I, and I feel like this is like for a Goya setting. 
for, for kids more yeah. than anybody else. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, but the, the adults, yeah, the, absolutely. The, the young adults, and, and adults in general, we're, we're today, I mean, divorce is rampant in this, right. in this country especially, but around the world too. And um, what is the appropriate approach to, to uh, relationships? I, I think that uh, as far as sexual relationships, is, if that's the focus, um, I would say that the church has given us a direction for many, for many centuries is that uh, sex is, is sacred in the sense that its purpose is to bring two people together so that they can create a church at home so that they can have children and create a, uh, a loving uh, relationship. And uh, it's not to be exploited for um, hedonism, okay, just pleasure. Sex is not for pleasure. It's it's not. It was not created for pleasure. That's why you see that when people become, uh, they run around and they they have they have many relationships. The diseases spread, and and it's it's a it's an unnatural kind of way to live when you when you are um, not uh, confined to your spouse and you do other things. And of course, there is betrayal when you're not confined to your spouse, and there is betrayal even ahead of marriage when you're not confined. Uh, to the person that you're going to get married with. So that, that means that we need to respect uh, the sexual uh, act and the sexual contact as a sacred act and see it as such and see it only as an act within marriage for the pers purposes of the kingdom of God in the sense of creating the church at home and helping each other uh, through that love that we exchange to... Um, uh, to enter the kingdom of God. That's the goal of marriage. So if we're using sex just for pleasure, it means that uh, we are distorting the purpose for it. And then we distort our relationships. We distort the way we look at people. And that is why a lot of people in, in our times, they have turned, especially men, have turned women into sexual objects. It happens also the other way. But uh, all this pornography that is, that is floating around and people fall into it sometimes, it becomes also a problem in relationships. It becomes a problem within marriage. It becomes a problem within, uh, e even psychologically for the people because they become addicted to it. So we need to be careful with sex. It's not to play around with it, and it's not just for pleasure, uh, as people have made it to. So that's my two cents for now, and we can get into other things another time. So here's one from Ima Laz. I don't know... Sorry if I said that wrong. Hello, and thank you for this. I was wondering what your opinion is on people who hear voices, see visions, hallucinate. I work with people in mental health services with these types of experiences. Hang on. Can't help but wonder oftentimes, like, this is what this person thinks. Yeah. What if this is demonic? Yeah, yeah. So I guess the question is, what is the difference between mental illness, seeing hallucinations, yeah. and a demonic hallucination? Uh -huh. Demonic sort of experience versus a mental illness experience. I think that's what they're saying, and if yeah. that's not what they're saying, I'm sorry. Well, I, th I think that before we examine a particular vision or hallucination of some sort, uh, I think we need to know if that person has a history of mental illness, because that changes everything, okay? If, if a vision comes to somebody who is, has, is affected uh, mentally because of chemical imbalances and, and mental illness, then you have, um, you have a specific approach. And we have, seen this, uh, we have seen this over and over again. I mean, I am in favor of using medications to help people with mental illness. Uh, but having said that, I don't think that every vision would be mental illness. And then I need to see what the life of that person is about how close they are to God, if this is from God or if this is from the devil. And there are ways to, to tell as, um, from the spiritual perspective. And I have encountered cases of demonic uh, influences and I have prayed over people uh, with exorcisms to be relieved from demonic influences. Um, and in those cases, I knew that the person involved had no mental illness. And I know until this day that those people did not have any mental illness. So, so I... We can tell when we examine somebody, we can tell. Um, mental illness will involve chemical imbalances. It will involve other things. But what I also can say with assurance is that sometimes the demons exploit a person with mental illness and they might 
appear to them or they might influence them. And that is a very difficult thing to differentiate. So people working with people with mental illness will have a hard time figuring out what was demonic and what was just the chemical imbalance uh, caused from chemical imbalance. Indeed. All right, so one last question. Okay. Okay. And, and I think this will uh, uh, eat up the time. Actually, could you say where they can reach you uh, at our website, or our, our Gmail? Uh, I yes, yes. Um, if you want to reach me, you can go through the Trisayon Productions at gmail.com, Trisayon Productions at gmail.com. And uh, if you go to the Trisayon, uh, um, Trisayon Films website, which is trisayonfilms.com, right? Uh, you can find also contact information for this. Um, and you can write to me directly in that way. Um, and uh, you, you can, from the comments, in the comments, through the comments, we can also send you the address if you want. Yeah. Okay, so last question. What is the view on original sin? <laughs> well, that's the biggest question. <laughs> you left it for last. Yeah. You want to talk for another hour? <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we do this? Um, well, I don't know how All right, let me, let me quickly say, yeah. let me quickly say that the term original sin is a Western term, yeah. not an Orthodox term, okay? The Orthodox patristic term from the early church until today is uh, propatory gon amartima, which means the sin of the forefathers, the sin of Adam and Eve, the sin of Adam, the transgression of Adam, things like that. Those are the terms that we use in the Orthodox church. Original sin, the term original sin and the meaning behind original sin comes from St. Augustine, a Western saint, who made a big mistake in that area. I have written a paper which was published uh, in the 90s on this, comparing Augustine and St. Chrysostom, and uh, I'm, I'm welcoming you to ask me and I'll send you the copy of the paper. It's, it was published by St. Vladimir's Theological Quarterly, and it was part of my dissertation, uh, and I had many, many conversations with Roman Catholic as well as Orthodox theologians who agreed with my understanding, and that's why I'm so sure, I'm absolutely sure that that is a good paper to read if you are interested in the differences between West and East and how the West went the way they went and the East remains in the same position as before Augustine. So, having said that, I would say that the consequences of the sin of Adam and Eve are the fact that our uh, passions have been aroused. And this is St. Chrysostom speaking, okay? It's part of my dissertation. So, uh, the, the consequences are that our, our, our passions are aroused, that we are um, uh, afflicted in the sense that our bodies have become now uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, mortal and death came into our lives. And now we need redemption. Now we need God to save us. We need God to help us to control ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit to help us to control ourselves and our passions. And we need to God to help us. That's why Christ became man and he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. He didn't just die on the cross. He came to die and rise again to regenerate humanity in himself, to restructure humanity in himself, to recreate humanity in himself. So he became the new man. He became the new creation. He became the new Adam. And when we partake of his body and blood in the Eucharist, we're partaking of the body and blood of the risen Christ. That's why we are receiving, even if it's for just those moments, okay, we are receiving eternal life. We're receiving healing. We're receiving recreation through him. And that's why we receive communion frequently. Because we walk out of the church and we fall again. We come back and we rejoin ourselves to him for salvation. When we join to him, we ascend into heaven with him. That's how important Holy Communion is. That's how I feel pain that I'm not able to give my, my, my parishioners now who are not able to come to church Holy Communion. But as soon as we're able, they will receive. We still need to take precautions as far as the virus is concerned and not affect ourselves. But 
communion will not affect us. Okay. So, we'll talk about the original sin more extensively, and if anybody is interested... We have a video. Uh, we do have a video, yeah. We, yeah. Please go to uh, Trisayon Films YouTube and find the video on original sin. We are interested. And you are, yeah, you are going to uh, hear me speak about it quite extensively, and then I'll give you the papers if you want. I have two papers on it. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. May God bless you and keep you and protect you and guide you. And uh, may the Lord have mercy on us and keep us safe through these difficult days and bring us together again in his churches uh, for his salvation that he has for us.